All right, so for the last part of the carbohydrates chapter, I ended up pulling up a lot of images. I apologize um, that you may not be able to copy them down quickly, but I just wanted to teach you the overall connectivity and some of the terminology that's used for polysaccharides. And first we'll start out with disaccharides. Disaccharide by its very definition means two carbohydrates linked together, right? In order to describe the linkage, we have to use very careful terminology, but let's zoom into maltose here. Maltose is found obviously in malt. So when you, let's say, make beer, you um, uh, use malted barley. And over here on this side, we've got a glucose unit. And over here, we've got a second glucose unit. Oop. So it's a disaccharide because we've taken two glucose units and we've tethered them together, right? But we need to describe this linker. Specifically, we need to describe the linkage going on here. And we have to do this using very careful terminology. So what we have to do is describe this as an alpha or a beta linkage. And down here, I'm already giving you the clue that this is an alpha linkage. And how do you think we can tell? What is that? It's pointed down, right? If we take a look at this position right here, you see the anomeric carbon for one of those sugars is in the axial position. Therefore, this is called an alpha linkage. And for the most part, the enzymes in our body that we have are really good at metabolizing alpha-linked carbohydrates, but not so good with beta-linked uh, carbohydrates. And we'll talk more about that later. So the other thing, too, is you might see a numbering system, and down in the name for maltose, it said a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Anytime you number a carbohydrate, you number going down the Fischer representation, right? So number one, the anomeric carbon, used to be the aldehyde. We know aldehydes have the highest priority. And then we go down, we'd say 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6. So in this case, it's basically saying the anomeric carbon carbon-1 on one of the glucoses, now has a glycosidic linkage with carbon-4 off of another carbohydrate. So you actually can tether together carbohydrates to new, make a new glycosidic bond. And I'm just going to write a glycosidic bond. Does that make sense? So maltose is a good example of that. It's just a simple disaccharide made of two glucose units. How do you spell glycosidic? Did I spell it right? I think I did. Oh, thank you. Sorry, my dyslexia is kicking in apparently. Glycosidic. There we go. All right, let's take a look at a counterexample. So for this one... We've got lactose. What's lactose found in? Milk. Milk and dairy products. There are a lot of people out there that have lactose intolerance. In fact, uh, my brother lives in China right now, and he was saying that a huge number of Chinese people do because they stopped drinking milk at a fairly young age, where Americans continually drink milk from uh, little kids through adulthood. Um, so it's something you can actually lose. If you don't eat dairy products regularly, you can become lactose intolerant. All right. So if we look at this, on the left-hand side, we've got a carbohydrate. This is galactose. And over here, we've got glucose. So two separate carbohydrates. Do you think this is an alpha or beta linkage? Beta, exactly. If we look at this, this is now a beta linkage. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between an alpha and a beta-linked um, uh, disaccharide. All right, sometimes you might see it drawn as a combo of a chair and a Haworth representation. I don't make this up, biologists do, so you can blame them. Here's an example. This is sucrose. This is common table sugar. But the key is don't let it intimidate you. First thing we've got to do is identify the anomeric carbon. So for example, over here, we would say this is our anomeric carbon, right? It's always a carbon adjacent to that oxygen in the ring system. Okay, so now that we have that figured out, we can really quickly say, is sucrose an alpha or a beta-linked disaccharide? 
it's alpha, right? If you think about it, that's the axial position. Equatorial would be kind of if you had some group sticking out here. We don't have any equatorial position. Yep. Is the second one going to be always something equatorial? Uh, the second one is often equatorial. You can get, it depends on the identity of the carbohydrate. That's a good question, though, but it just depends. So in this case, we've got a beta link disaccharide and sucrose being table sugar is easily metabolized by everybody right so unlike lactose where you have a lot of people that are intolerant to it sucrose people can metabolize very easily yep oh sorry this is alpha thank you I, this is alpha linked because it's in the axial position thank you so sucrose is actually made up of glucose on one side does anybody know what the other half is Fructose. That is one interesting thing. You hear a lot about fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup. People say it's bad for you to have fructose in your diet. The reality is half of all the table sugar you eat is fructose. So yeah, you don't want an excess of it, um, but it's found naturally in sugar. So it's not a huge deal to have fructose in your diet. All right? Uh, yeah. So on the exam, I wouldn't ask you to memorize the structure of carbohydrates. Instead, I might give you a problem and say, is this disaccharide, alpha, or beta? Or I might give you a reaction where I say, form the glycosidic bond, um, like we covered the other day, or in your pod, something like that. That would be fair. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at polysaccharides. And again, I apologize because this is an image, but really what I want to emphasize is the connectivity, right? So if we look at cellulose, essentially we've got a bunch of glucose units. I'm just going to abbreviate it. So we've just got a big polymer of repeating glucose units. Are these alpha or beta linked? Beta, exactly. If we go through and we look at this, all of these link linkages are equatorial. That means that these are all beta linked. Which makes sense because when you think about cellulose, can we digest it easily? No. In fact, cows and animals that eat primarily plants, um, what they do for at least cows is they've got multiple stomachs. What happens in the first stomach? Anybody know? Yeah, there's a lot of gas being produced. What happens is their uh, first stomach is full of bacteria. The bacteria can cleave these bonds, no problem. And then after the bacteria cleave these bonds, then it gets shuttled to the next stomach that can digest the glucose monomers. In your first gut in a cow, though, they actually produce a huge amount of methane. There's a fascinating piece on NPR saying um, that that's actually a big component of greenhouse gas being emitted. And so they're trying to figure out how to feed uh, supplements to cows to get them to stop burping so much methane. It's a weird global problem that people are working on. But glucose is interesting that way. Or sorry, cellulose. Yep. You were saying symbiotic relationship with bacteria. What does that exactly mean? It just means the cow can't process the cellulose without having the bacteria do some of the legwork of breaking these bonds. The bacteria have the enzymes capable of breaking that. Do you want to hear another gross one? I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> uh, another gross one is rabbits. Does anybody have a rabbit? No? All right, so rabbits, if you've ever had a rabbit, they can't digest cellulose, right? They're a mammal, they can't do it very readily. So what they do is they eat it, they poop it out, basically absorb nothing, and then bacteria ferments their own poop, then they eat their poop. So they're called hindgut fermenters. Um, it's super gross, but that's the way rabbits are. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's cellulose. The next one, is this alpha or beta linked? Alpha. If we look at this, we can t see pretty clearly these are all axial. So now we've got a bunch of glucose monomers that are all alpha linked. And these are easily digestible. Um, this isn't quite what humans can digest, or I should say they can digest it, but it's not what humans store as an energy storage. Um, does anybody know where we store most of our glucose? In your liver, absolutely. So your liver is this big sink for glucose polymers like this. 
However, in your liver, it gets a bit more complicated. In your liver, what you have is a huge amount of branching. So let's just make a note of this. Your liver stores alpha-linked glucose that is highly branched. So basically your body, when you have an excess of sugar, will start shuttling it into your liver for long-term storage, just in case you need that energy later, right? And if we look at this, you can tell pretty easily all of these are axial, which means that they can be broken down pretty easily, including the side branching here, which is why we tend to store this in our own bodies, as it's easy for us to metabolize quickly into free glucose monomers. Yep? So if some of us are going to biotech stuff, uh, do we have, we have to memorize like, these kinds of things in So it completely depends on your instructor. Um, Biochem classes, from my experience, can be taught from a few different angles. I've seen biochem teachers where they just say, memorize everything. And then I've seen other ones where they're like, I want you to understand every chemical step with what you're doing and understand the why. So it just, just depends on your instructor. All right, there's one last class of polymers that I did want to show. This is more important for marine mammals. And if we look at this one, this is chitin. Chitin, if you look at it, has a bunch of n acyl derivatives. If you remember, right, I said that an acyl group is anything like this, and it's called an n acyl because it's coming off the nitrogen. So in this case, chitin is actually involved with the shells of a lot of animals, including marine animals and insects. So this is a polymer that's not easily digested by people, but can be because it is beta-linked, right? So if we look at this and actually beta-link all of these, um, the other interesting thing is how many of you have heard of cricket powder? I think one of the bio classes here, they actually have you try it. But there's um, a big push towards getting um, more protein from insects because the carbon footprint for insects is incredibly low compared to like a meat source. Um, and you get a combo of proteins and these carbohydrates out of it too. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I remember watching Blade Runner recently, the new one, and they had grub farms. So there are scientists that think in the future we'll be eating a lot of grubs and insects. So it's interesting, but kind of gross at the same time. All right, so that's kind of it for the chapter. Like I said, with the polysaccharides, what I'm most interested in is you being able to quickly assess if it's alpha or beta-linked. Um, if we look at the reaction summaries for this chapter, uh, essentially the most important reaction, in my opinion, is being able to do the ring closing and ring opening reaction, but that's a review of our aldehyde chapter. So you should be able to do that to form a five- or six-membered ring. And then we saw reactions of monosaccharides. Um, the first one we saw was acylation, where you can use acetic anhydride, acylate every single one of the alcohols coming off your ring. The other one was with methyl iodide, so you can do alkylation of all those same alcohol groups. Then the next one was a reaction with an alcohol or an amine to form some sort of glycoside, right? So that's when you have a non-OH group coming off of there, and that could be an N-glycoside or an O-glycoside. The other one, too, we didn't really show, but makes a lot of sense, is sodium borohydride. What will that do, and why? It's a reducing agent. And if we think about our standard or alcohol, or I can't talk today. If we think about our standard carbohydrates, they all have, or our aldoses, they all have aldehydes there. So if you've got an aldehyde or a ketone, you can reduce either one of those. And if you do that, essentially all you're doing is converting your aldehyde or ketone to an alcohol. So it's the same aldehyde chemistry we've seen just in a new context, right? The other one we saw was the oxidation of your aldehyde, and that can be done with bromine or water. Um, the key thing with this one is it won't oxidize this lower alcohol. To oxidize your lower primary alcohol, you need to use a stronger oxidant, meaning nitric acid and water and heat, and then you get your aldonic acid. Does that make sense? 
So these were the main reactions we saw for monosaccharides. Yeah, if you use a really strong oxidant like chromic acid, it will just decompose and turn into charcoal. So it's just not effective to use anything stronger than that. All right, the next one was chain lengthening and shortening. Um, these reactions, like I said, are pretty old school. They're not synthetically used anymore, but I did want to show you them for the historical context of seeing them and understanding how they work. It's pretty clever chemistry. Any questions? No? All right, what I did do was I made a short fill-in-the-blank study guide because I know a lot of people like just having these to print off and fill them in, so you're welcome to use that as well. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you know, 